On this episode of the Massive Agent Podcast, I'm bringing on Neil Mathweg as a guest, the host of the Onion Juice Podcast, the godfather of the Snap Pack. And we cover a lot. We talk about his system that he uses to generate new buyer clients from open houses and sell the listing, what to look forward to when the market correction happens, and how to find sponsors for your show. The Massive Agent Podcast. We lead generation tips and strategies to get you more leads and sell more homes. I love to buy houses. I like to sell houses. It takes brass balls to sell real estate. Wait a minute. The leads are weak. You're weak. I've had better. Oh, have I got your attention now? Here's your host, Dustin Brome. Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 31 of the Massive Agent Podcast. I am your host, Dustin Brome. I'm a realtor in Salt Lake City, Utah with eXp Realty. I'm the founder of the Massive Agent Society and searchsaltlake.com. I think you guys are in for a treat today. This is this is a very, very good episode. We go, we go in depth. This is the longest episode we've ever done. But today we're bringing on Neil Mathweg, the host of the Onion Juice podcast, a great realtor up in Madison, Wisconsin. He was formerly the the CEO of uh, of his brokerage up there. Prior to that, he was a, a licensed realtor for 13 years, where he averaged selling at least 70 homes a year. Now, he took a step aside after 13 years to become CEO of the brokerage, and he did that for three years. When I met him, he was the CEO of the brokerage, and he was he was really involved in training and coaching his agents. But he's recently, within the last year, he's actually stepped down as the CEO to become a licensed realtor again. He is now a full-time realtor once again, and he's what's crazy, and you'll hear it from him, he's basically starting over from scratch. I get asked by so many people, new agents and people who are moving to another market, and they're basically starting from scratch. And they're like, hey, what do I do? They're like, I don't, I don't have a database here. I don't have any contacts here. What do I do? Or if you're a brand new agent, you do have contacts, but you don't have any, uh, any experience in the industry. So, uh, two totally different things. But Neil, uh, he is starting over from scratch. So he has some great perspective on what that looks like and what he's done since starting over to really get the business cranking again. And he's since built a bit of a team and he's, he's rolling. And he has some great things to share to help you to do the same thing that he's doing. We cover a lot of different topics. And for you guys that have reached out and said, hey, you know, why does it only have to be 20 minutes? Why can't you do, you know, 30, 60 minutes? Here you go. This is for you. There's a lot of gold in this one, guys. There's a lot of gold nuggets. So take notes, rewind it, what, do whatever you need to do. And I promise you there's value until the very, very end. So let's get into the interview with the man himself, Neil Mathweg, the host of the Onion Juice podcast. Here we go. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm sitting here with the godfather of the Snap Pack himself, Neil Mathweg, host of the Onion Juice podcast, and your coach as well, real estate coach. Yes. How you doing, many, man? I'm doing great. Doing great. Awesome. Welcome, welcome awesome. to the show. Excited to be on here, man. This is great. Absolutely. You're the you're the uh, you're the uh, Bill Murray of the Onion Juice podcast. You've been on so much, and it's <laughs> awesome for me to finally get on your show. So this is great. Uh, well, you got to start somewhere. I mean. Great. Bill Murray, Bill Murray, something to aspire to on on my show. So let's got to start with the first, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Start from the bottom. Now we're here. It's good. <laughs> All the way up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so your your podcast, uh, you're at like episode one forty seven or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Crazy. Amazing consistency. And you know, your podcast was definitely an inspiration for me for getting started because I saw the power of the podcast. And, and so that it's been cool to watch you and, and to be on your show a few times. Um, it's crazy. So when I call Neil, the godfather of the snap pack, it, this goes all the way back to his, his podcast episode 23, where he, he brought on, um, five of us, uh, and him who were on Snapchat and we were using Snapchat for real estate and Alex Wang in Silicon Valley. He's like, Oh, we're the snap pack. And, Neil kind of facilitated that whole group and had us on um, sub. I almost used a big word that I have no business using. I almost said subsequent, but let's not do that. Whoa. Let's not do that. That's that's weird. But he had he had us on on other episodes in the future, and it, the snap pack just kind of started. So you're the godfather of it all, my friend. Yeah, yeah, and I I still. I mean, that's 120 some episodes ago, 120 weeks ago. Man, we were just babies. That's like two at, years at the point. Yeah, over yeah. two years. Yep, and I still remember recording that show. I mean, one of them is I I called the 
Eric Larkin old. Um, yeah, the old guy. Yeah. The old guy. I'm like, so Eric, you're the old guy. How do you use Snapchat? <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I've never lived that down. But then I also just remember too, just uh, how you and I clicked on that show, and like, uh, just just um, the, the insight that you had, the knowledge you had, and uh, it's been awesome to to collaborate with you over the years. And and I'm just pumped that you got this show going because you're full of great ideas and great content. So it's, it's good stuff. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it, it's good to finally have you on. This this was, let's see, this is episode thirty one, and the reason that I wanted to have you on the show is is recently, or, or it's been less than a year, right? Since you, yeah, okay, yep. less than a year ago, you actually uh, stepped down as the CEO of your brokerage there in Madison, Wisconsin, and you decided to become a full time realtor again. And so, right. and how many years were you uh, were you the CEO of the brokerage? So I was the CEO for 13 years. Or I'm sorry, I was the CEO for three years, and I was uh, an, an agent prior to that for 13 years. Okay, okay. Uh, so yeah. 13 years as an agent, you become CEO for three, and shit, the industry changed a lot over that three years, didn't it? Definitely did, yes, yes. Uh, was, uh, technology and everything. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of uh, – it was it was it was great to grow the brokerage firm during that time, and we tripled the size of the firm. And 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 I you know I was able to launch Onion Juice. I was able to launch my coaching program. Uh, I did it all because I just absolutely love coaching. Um, but then it was like I missed the sales. And as the CEO, I vowed to not do sales. Instead, I vowed to give my referrals to you know agents in our company. And that that was great. But it was uh, it was it was something was missing there. And, uh, and also I feel like I'm a better coach because I'm in, in sales. Like you, you, you get away from it for so long. Uh, and I was coaching things that were working back in 2012 where I was teaching things that are happening now in 2017 or so, let's say, but I didn't even know if it worked. You know, I mean, I was, I was coaching ideas and not being an actual practitioner. So now you were a I'm total fraud, is, basically. That's right. Total that's fraud. Right. right. Yeah, like, I think that this is a good idea. I think it'll work. And <laughs> if it doesn't, I don't know why it wouldn't. You're not doing it right if it doesn't. No. Totally. Um, but now it's like, Hey, I, I, the, you know, the things that I'm coaching, I'm doing in the grind every day. So it's, it's much more powerful this way. Love it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense is it, you, you do become a much more effective coach if you're if you're actively pra practicing what you're coaching, for sure. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, so you stepped down as the CEO uh, less than a year ago, and you're now back as a full time realtor. And so, I wanted to talk to you about what it's like to start over, to start from mm -hmm. scratch, because I imagine like you literally started from scratch, even though you had some expertise and and perspective from from those 13 years. Things changed so much, and like you hadn't been a realtor in three years. What was that? And what was that first month like? When you when you're like okay I'm a realtor again what was that first month like? It was it was harder than what I had imagined. I thought I would flip a switch and it would just all come back. I was doing 75 to 100 transactions a year for 13 years, and so I thought you know I'm gonna I'm gonna flip the switch and 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 I'm gonna build this right back up. Uh, it didn't happen that way. I mean, I've got, I've, I had a you know few sales that happened right away. You know, people that I just happened to time it right that I reached out to them and, and they were actually thinking about doing something. But but for the most part, my database of 330 customers was was left alone for three years. They had moved on. Uh, you know, I mean, and in in those in those three years, I had uh, well over I don't know probably 60 to 70 of them call me. And want me to list, but I had to tell them that I wasn't doing sales anymore. So they've all moved on. A lot of them listed with other agents in our firm, but I was I was starting over. Uh, also, I had no Facebook presence. I had no media presence. I wasn't operating on any pillars for three years, and so it was uh, the reality came probably a month to two into coming back that I was starting completely over. Nice. So, yeah, you kind of walk in, you're like. Like I'm the godfather of the snap pack, bitch. I'm gonna right. I'm gonna knock this out of the park. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what my mindset was. And then I was about two months in. I'm like, oh shit, this this isn't going the way I thought it was gonna go. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. yeah. That, that's when. Yeah. So that's when reality kicked in. That like everything you've been you've been uh, preaching and and teaching your clients and everything your coaching clients is it's like wow. Like I 
I have to do every single one of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it. I, I it was I was coaching myself and it was really interesting to go through. And it and again, you know, we talked like it, it just helps me be a better coach being in. And and so it was a it was a reality shot right away in the beginning. Like, OK, I better get my plan set up just like how I coach agents to set their plan up. Well, good thing you had a good coach. I mean, that's right. Could you imagine if you had me or someone like a shit? You're in trouble. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, just, just go sell houses, dude. Right? Yeah, that's all. It's funny. Yeah, I yeah. think everybody experiences this, but when I first got in the business, uh, my my wife, who was just my fiance at the time, she's like, "Oh, I, you know, how many houses did you sell today?" <laughs> well, I sold four today, and tomorrow I've got another seven. <laughs> yeah. Not, not exactly. Uh, yeah, it, it's, we work in a crazy, crazy industry, but it's, it's rewarding. And if you bust your ass doing the right things consistently, it pays off. Um, I, I wanted to ask what, what did you notice this time around being a realtor that is completely different or just that's changed, uh, in a, in a way that is unrecognizable from when, when you were a realtor the first 13 years? Yeah, I just the way that I was chasing uh, was different. So uh, what I what I coach is that, is that to have a three pillar plan. So the first pillar is what you're going to do with your sphere of influence. The second pillar is what you're going to do to chase, and the third pillar is what you're going to do to attract. The chase is really what has been different for me. Uh, my two chases that I have is Facebook advertising and open houses, and prior to in, in the in in previous years, there was a statistic out that only one percent of houses sold from open houses, and and so I was actually if you look at my YouTube channel, I have a video from like 2012 where I am just bashing open houses and and just saying that they they don't work that you know everybody shops online today that you know open houses aren't a aren't a thing anymore. And I really, my mindset, my mindset was away from open houses, and they were more towards what I had a pre-recorded information line. I had a one eight hundred number where people would call in and get the pre-recorded information, and then it was caller ID, and then I would I would call them back, and that's how I was doing a lot of my chasing. I was also doing the fizzles and expired back then. And and I feel like today's market has changed so much for Fizzbowl and expired hunting that uh, that most of the Fizzbowls are listing flat fee MLS and therefore they're not available. There you can't in the state of Wisconsin we can't solicit them uh, because they're listed with a broker. And then uh, and then the expireds were were is also hard in this market because houses there's not a lot of expireds. There's there's houses uh, everything's selling. Um, and so it was really difficult. Uh, for me to get back and, and like say, okay, I'm going to focus on fizzbos and expired like I did in 2013 through 15 uh, and absolutely crushed it in that time with fizzbos and expireds. And so switching to going with Facebook advertising, which I didn't do prior to becoming a CEO and switching and focusing on open houses uh, is again, something I didn't do. Um, and so my chase is what was completely different uh, than, than ever before. And a totally different market too. Um, you right. know, like you said, there's no expireds, and it, I mean, same thing in Salt Lake. If there's an expired listing, there's a problem. Like, I don't want to go it's anywhere right. near that expired listing. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yep. That's not something I even entertain as an option anymore. Is is uh, farming expireds? Maybe for somebody it works, and they might find one out of you know, however many. Yep. yep. One out of three, because there's. Only three in like the whole county. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah, the market has changed dramatically as well. Um, that's interesting though. So uh, you do a lot with open houses. I've heard you talk about open houses on your on your podcast. Tell us a bit more about what that looks like. Uh, for somebody listening and maybe they're brand new and they're wondering, hey, how, do, how can I get my first few deals? They don't have a, a huge budget. What should they do? And is open houses the right, the right uh, route to go for them? Yeah, it, that's the beautiful thing about an open house is that it's it's for an agent that doesn't have a lot of money to invest. It is ideal, uh, and and so you're going to need to invest in signs, and you want to have your system down for your open house, and you want to do open houses with excellence. And what I've what I 
what I do and what I coach my team to do at open houses is we really focus on providing value uh, to to the customer. Um, so we always give out, we have the home scouting app that we always uh, let people know about if, they, if they're a first time home buyer, we have first time home buyer grants that we know about. And so we're always trying to connect them with the lender to, to uh, you know, get involved in the first time home buyer grants. And so we're always trying to provide value, but what we're really, really focusing on, our one mission out of everybody that walks in the door is to get their criteria. Uh, we ask them questions like, you know, if I'm standing in a tri-level, I'll ask them, so do you like the tri-level or would you guys rather have a ranch or a two-story? Uh, and, you know, and then what, what didn't you like about the house? Oh, it doesn't have a master bathroom. Okay, I understand you. So master bathroom is really important to you. Uh, what do you think of the garage? Is that garage size pretty good for you? Uh, does it have enough bathrooms for you? You know, and I, and I'm, I'm just, asking them questions about the house that I'm standing in to gather information on their search criteria. Then what I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm putting all of their notes in the follow-up boss, that's the CRM that we use, and we put all of their uh, information in our CRM so that we have their search criteria. We're using iPads for them to sign in because we're getting accurate information, and then we say that we're doing a paperless open house. So, What do you the, use to get them to sign in? Um, it's actually Easy Agent Pro. So you're using Easy their Agent open Pro. house uh, yeah. functionality. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yep. And then that uh, that sends them a text with the information. Actually, we have it going right to follow up, boss. But Easy Agent Pro, you could use their texty program. But we uh, we go from the the app to follow up boss and then follow up boss texts and emails them the brochure. And so what we say is we just, we do paperless open houses. So go ahead and sign in and we'll, and then that'll automatically email you and text you the brochure. So you can have it right on your phone as you're walking through the house and, and we get everybody to sign in and it, it, it works great. And then we would just focus on getting their search criteria because once we have their search criteria, then we can follow up with them on a, on a, a weekly basis or whenever we can, whatever we can, um, to find them another listing that matches their criteria. And so um, we want to get them set up for searches, but in our market, we also have coming soon marketing. So we have a withheld by seller status. So we search that withheld by seller status two times a day uh, to always be looking for houses that match up with our other buyers. And really what I focus on is just becoming a matchmaker. Um, I want to find, I want to get buyer search criteria, and then I want to look for houses that nobody knows about yet or that are not yet on the market. And then I call them with that information and say, hey, there's a house coming on the market. It's going to be listed next Wednesday. Um, do you want to set up a time to see it? I'll get the address once I can. I'll tell you more about it once I can, but just wanted to know if you have any time next Wednesday to see a house. And uh, and that's how we're winning. That's how we're that's how we're you know, we're, we're meeting buyers. Um, that's how we're winning at open houses. We're very intentional. We have a, 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 a plan, uh, in place to capture these buyers and, it, and it's working wonderful. Fantastic. I, I know a lot of people do have success with open houses. Here's my beef with, with open houses. And, and I've heard, I'm going to push back a little bit because like for getting, for getting new clients, for, for attracting new buyers, it's awesome. But as far as selling that particular listing, that you are doing the open house for, is it really effective? Yeah. So in this market, it is because almost well, we 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 list every house and we do an open house on that on that first weekend, and we are getting you know in this market we're getting tons of people through. In previous markets, no, it wasn't, and and that's why I was against it because I wanted to do what was best for my seller. OK. And so what we used to do in the previous market is that we would do no showings until Saturday's open house or Sunday's open house. And we would do open houses for one hour versus two hours. And and there, there what would happen then is in a market where there was no urgency, we would create urgency because they would get to this open house. It was on Saturday. It was it would stand out from everybody else doing them on Sunday. And it was only for one hour. And it created this frenzy. And so that's how what we would tell the sellers is that by doing it this way, it's going to benefit you. Every other way is it just brings the neighbors and the tire kickers out and it doesn't actually sell the house. And in fact, only 1% of houses sell from open houses. Now I look at this market and I look at the buyers that, were, that are coming to the open house. A lot of them already have agents and they're there with their agents and they're, they're, they're there because they're ready to write an offer. Um, and we get to Sunday night or Monday morning and we have four or five offers on the house. 
And so if that open house didn't happen, I'm sure we would still get those offers, but it's still creating that frenzy. And, and then those buyers start to see how many other people are there uh, and, it, and it helps sell the house. And also what we're doing with, with helping buyers, the questions that we're asking is also providing feedback for our seller. Right. Like when we ask them, you know, I'm standing in a tri level and they say, well, will we really want a ranch. I can tell a buyer, I can tell the seller that, hey, these people weren't interested in the house because they they want a ranch. I don't know why they came to the open house, but um, they want really want a ranch or they wanted a master bathroom. And uh, so it it, uh, it provides information. Also, we get to meet the buyers that are writing the offers is what I love about the open houses, too. Uh, if, if you just have the showing set up. The, the the you know we're not there for every showing but uh, if if we're there uh, and the you know the buyers with their agent and and they love the house and we get to meet the agent and the, the buyers and uh, it just helps us give more feedback to our sellers to to help them understand if this is a good offer to accept or not. Nice, yeah. And, and as you were as you were talking, I was I was going to ask you, it, like, wouldn't the house have sold anyways without the open house if it's yeah, such definitely. a hot seller's market? And it would, but. But I agree with you. The open house, especially if you list it on a Wednesday and no showings until Saturday or whenever the open house is, and in mm -hmm. your state, make sure that you're following all the guidelines guidelines there. Because in Utah, you can only do it three days ahead. Um, if you're not going to yeah. accept, if you're not going to let showings happen, it needs to be listed no more than three days from the open house. So if you're doing that, yeah, that creates a, a frenzy. And and I I love the tip you gave for for those for those people who are listening who are not in a hot seller's market and those markets are out there there's there's slow markets there's even uh, downturning markets and so that by doing the open house for just an hour and listing it and then no showings until the open house that's a great way to create uh, a create demand uh, for yeah. for a listing when maybe there wouldn't have been nearly as much so that's I love that so uh, it, I thought of something to go off on a tangent about you know I've got to go on, go off on something Right. <laughs> feedback. How, I I hate I hate when my sellers are like, "Whoa, what kind of feedback was I getting?" Uh, the only feedback that freaking matters is are they making an offer or not. If they're not, okay, because that's all you need to know. Like you said, those idiots that show up and they're like, "Well, you know, we really want a ranch." It's like, "Well, what the hell are you here for?" Like, right, right. This, you give that feedback to a seller. What good does that do? They can't do anything about it. Yeah, they yeah. can't do a damn thing about it. Uh, right, and, right. and if it's something that they can do something about, it's so minuscule that they should be writing the offer anyways. Right, right. Yeah, where, what I coach my sellers on is is just to look for trends. If if everybody's saying that it smells, then we we got a problem. But if one person says it smells, then something was wrong with their nose. Right. Yeah, it was their uh, upper or, lip. Yeah, right, right. And so so like I, I just tell my sellers, let's look for trends. And we can do things if, – if there's something that we can do about that trend, then we need to do that. But for the most part, we let a lot of it just roll off. But if something keeps coming up and we and it's something that we can address, then we address it. And the other thing too in this market, we don't even have time for feedback. I could care less about feedback. Just are you right. writing an offer or not, right? And how many offers am I going to be collecting and need to be – need to be presenting um and so but in in a down market or like right now we anything priced over four hundred thousand in madison is is pretty slow and so you know we it, the the feedback is like crucial like the sellers holding on to every word that's said uh in in that market because it's, it's harder to sell and i remember you know in the recession oh my gosh we lived off of feedback like what do we got to do to to get the buyer to buy this house you know and, oh, uh, and where are we at with price? And uh, yeah, it's crazy. You know, I've talked about this before, but I think it's so crucial for for buyers agents right now when it's the most competitive it will be probably ever. Uh, when you have to beat out eighteen other buyers, if you can find a way to win those bidding wars, like those skills are, you're going to absolutely wipe up when it becomes a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. then you can use that to your advantage to get a better deal on a property. You can't get deals on properties in yeah. in these markets. It's like how much money are you going to throw at the seller is the only question. Right? Are you going to go ten yeah. grand over asking or or thirty? I mean, those are the choices. So yeah, it, yeah, it's it's crazy. I, dude, I've talked about it before, and I know you and I have talked about it, but I can't wait for the downturn. There's so many jokers in the business that that have no. They really shouldn't be. And for those of us who are content marketers and we have a good online presence and good social media presence, 
when people are forced to go to Google to find a realtor, they're going to find me. But when their cousin Joe got their license two weeks ago, and you know they have four four family members who all have their license within the last year, and they just list with them, they never actually go to Google to find me. So, right. uh, you know, and anybody who's been starting off on the content marketing journey, look forward to that because you start the work now when the downturn happens and all these part timers and all these opportunists who, who just got their license cause it's hot and there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But the, most people are in it for the wrong reasons and they're not doing what it takes to win cause they have a jaded view of, of winning. This market makes it seem like you're winning. If you get listings and you sell it within an hour, it, that's just the market. Like all you did was put it on the MLS, you know? Right. Right. So yeah, I, uh, I, I, in the, in the last recession, I would say that 25% of my business came from referral agents. So agents that were in my office that were no longer in the business and people would call them and I would, you know, pay that agent a, a referral fee. And, but that was about 25% of my business from 2000, probably nine to 12. Wow. Uh, 25% yeah. and 25% of my business yep. from agents who were no longer in the business because it, it you know, the business dried up for them. Yep. And you were their guy. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. So I, I, I had three agents that were, I had one agent that I, I just took over her business. She handed me like six listings and she just, she was out. She just wanted to get out of it. And, uh, and then, and she kind of, there was a small little suburb town, uh, that she, that she worked in. She still had the office storefront and everything there. And she just, she switched business. She got into financial advising instead of real estate and she kept her office, just changed her sign. But this, that business had been there for 20 years. So people would just walk in and say, I'm ready to list my house. It's just a small town thing. And she's like, I don't, I don't sell anymore, but here's Neil's card and give him a call. And then she texts me and say, so-and-so is going to be calling you. And I mean, I listed probably 10, 15 houses a year for her for, for two, three years in a row. So they just kept their, their license active so they could get the referral fees. Right. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and you know, you, you, there's just a different opportunity that comes up like that in the recession right. that, that isn't, isn't there otherwise. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And not to mention the properties that go on sale, mm -hmm. you, you know, like if, if you've been wanting to buy a home in a certain neighborhood, but it's just gotten so overheated and all of a sudden, you know, the market's at a 30 or 40% discount. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. If you're prepared for it, if you've made plans now for when that happens. Um, so it, it's just important to think about. So if you're listening, just think about what things look like when the market is opposite of what it is now, when prices right. come down, not go up, when you have to actually like actively search for buyers, you know, just like you're actively searching for sellers. It's like, please sell your house. Now it's going to be, please buy a house. Right. Um, Think about yep. what that looks like with your business model and prepare for it and, you know, put some money away, uh, have, you know, six months of expenses, if at all possible, set aside. And man, it's, it's going to be crazy. But when do you think that, when do you think a downturn is going to happen nationally? Um, I've, I've been pegging it more like the, the two to three years, but here's my stick on all of this is I look at. I look at cost versus value. And prior to the recession in 2007, the, val the value was below the cost. Okay, so you could, you could buy something for less. I'm sorry, the cost was below the value. So you could buy something for less than it cost to build. So when we were building new construction, there was an automatic 10% margin versus what it cost us to build it versus what the value would support. Right now in Madison, Wisconsin, it's flipped. So the cost is a premium. It costs more to build than it does the value of the home. And I do not, I cannot imagine the cost going down. For one, labor hasn't increased, so labor is is still trending low, so labor can't be taken out of it. Um, oil prices, which a lot of oil is used in construction, in manufacturing, and in, in, in materials, um, and so oil prices I don't see going down. Um, and then just the the cost to build, the overall cost, you look at everything, is not going to go down. Um, and so with that, the only thing that can give is land. 
Um, and right now there's such a lack of inventory that I don't see the land going down anytime soon here in my local market. Every market is different, right? But here in my local market. So that's the one big difference that I see. Also, inventory in Madison, Wisconsin right now is at 1.8 months of inventory. And, and in 2007, the lowest it ever, the prior to the recession, the lowest that ever got was around five months of inventory. So again, another big difference in amount of inventory. So I looked at the trend of 2007, uh, 2006, we averaged like Five, around five months of inventory. 2007, it went to seven months. And then 2008 is when it went up to double digits. And it was at 10, 12, and then all, all the way up to 18 months of inventory. Um, and so it swings really quick. So those that are saying, hey, we got such low inventory that it's going to take forever. No, it, it doesn't take long for that inventory to, to swing. Um, and so, And we're seeing higher inventory and higher prices right now. Um, that's starting to get more even into a seller's market. We've, you know, over, over, I think it's over 500,000 or maybe it's 750 here in Madison is at, uh, is at eight months of inventory. So seller's market does the balance market is at six. So I think, uh, I just, I don't, I think we're going to have a correction. I don't think we're going to have a recession is what I think. It'll be really interesting because it's just a different world than it was back then. And I wonder, I wasn't even talking i wasn't planning on talking about like macroeconomic shit but let's do I'm it because <laughs> we're obviously we're obviously like certified credentialed economists here right. obviously <laughs> especially me so no jokes aside like you know we yeah. have to stay up on this stuff and it's interesting and you know like i follow the crypto world and and wall street and everything too because it all it's all kind of intertwined in real estate because real estate is an asset just like just like stocks just like bonds so it's good to know this stuff. So it's a, it's a totally different world where like what effect did all that money printing do that happened after the last recession, you know, with with the quantitative easing. All that money that's just been pushed into the economy by the Fed, what effect is that going to have long term? We don't know because that hasn't happened in previous recessions. And so it, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. It's I think it's I think we will have a recession, but it'll be for completely different reasons, and I don't know what those are. But Right. Who knows? Just yeah. be prepared. That's all. Yep. And and just if you're listening to this and you've never been through a recession, don't don't have fear around it because I, I mean I did have some rough years. I'll never forget 2011. It was it was I uh, I made as much in 2011 as I paid in taxes in 2012. So that's how that's how reversed I was in 2011. Um, but but don't have fear around it because there's opportunity in every market. And and you just have to shift. You just have to be okay with it and shift and not get wrapped up in the sky is falling. I mean, I remember there was a, there was days where I I I mean, when I, I remember when when one of the finance programs that we used, uh, uh, we did um, half of our deals. Uh, it was a it, uh, it was a program here in the state of Wisconsin, and they 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 stopped the program. They no longer were going to be lending. I'm like, what? How how are we going to sell houses now? Uh, you know, so there was all these things that just came that you really felt like the sky was falling. And then I had never even heard of short sale, never even heard of foreclosures. Uh, and that ended up being a majority of my business moving forward. Um, so it was just, you know, there's just opportunities that come and you just got to ride it and, and you'll be in it. They're healthy. And also, if you can save up cash right now and stockpile some cash in this market, get ready to buy in the next recession. There was deals galore. Absolutely. Everybody is panicking, think, you know, and you listen to the news during a recession and they make it sound like nobody is ever going to buy another stock. Nobody's ever going to buy right. or sell a house like it's, you know, dead. No, that's when you actually do go out and buy because that's when panic is at its highest. Um, yeah, it's crazy. This whole this whole segment here, Neil, with um, how we were talking about economics and the downturn and everything like that, even though it's great info, it's one giant squirrel. And listeners of, of the Massive Agent podcast know that the squirrel is our number one f most frequent guest. The squirrel <laughs> is the Bill Murray of my show. There you go. Yeah. That's awesome. Sometimes they stick around for just a couple minutes or, you know, 30 seconds. This one was – this squirrel sitting sitting pretty. This That's is a cool. good one. <laughs> it is. Fat and happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
people who are starting over, maybe they knew, they've moved to a brand new market and they're starting from scratch in a new market or they're a new realtor, aside from uh, open houses and, and contacting your database and everything like that, uh, what are some pointers that you have for, for, an, for an agent starting over? Yeah. So, so just have a clear plan. Focus on building three pillars. You want it, you want something in your sphere of influence. You want something in your chase, and you want some you want something to chase with, and you want to have an attraction. So, sphere of influence might be low, right? You might not know very many people, especially if you're new to a city. So, you need to work hard to meet people. You need to say yes to everything. Remember when we were kids and they told us to just say no to drugs? Well, you just need to say yes to everything. So, when oh, it's, I just said when yes it, to, all, to all the drugs, I did too. Before. I know I didn't. I didn't. No. Like, I wore that shirt because it was cool. But yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't do drugs, uh, kids. Right, don't do drugs. No, nope. so look at this guy. Not, um, turn out like me. Yeah, <laughs> so um, so you've got to just say yes to everything, and you've got to get out there, and you've got to meet people. Uh, the other thing that I like about the attraction pillar, and what I mean by attraction, is is being a media company that happens to sell real estate, producing content. It could be if you're a writer, write. If you're into video, do video. If you're if you're you have a face for radio like I do, then do a podcast. Um, but do something that is going to create content, because with that is not only are you producing content that can attract people to you, but also you are going to meet a lot of people. And so so that's crucial is, is getting out there. I mean, I, I watched Sue Pinky Benson down in Florida uh, and, and watching her, the number of people that she does lives with and the number of people that she's meeting – that the the value isn't necessarily in those videos. The value is is the relationships that she's building uh, along the way. So that's uh, that's really important. I think when starting over, we we launched a, a a show here called I Love Madison. It's more than just a show. It's a it's a podcast. It's a vlog. It's a blog. Uh, we are working uh, to help people that are new to Madison get connected to people, places, and events. And so with that, we're documenting all people, places, and events, and we're doing uh, advertising to attract those that are new to help them get connected. And specifically, we're catering to what we call the trailing spouse. And the trailing spouse is somebody that moved with their spouse to uh, a, the, the community and maybe a re little re reluctant to move here. But the job was so well that their spouse took that they, they move here anyways. They become lonely. They become isolated. Their spouse is at the job getting super connected, knowing everybody, and loves Madison. And meanwhile, the, the trailing spouse is home, lonely, isolated, and uh, really just wants to move back home. And so this is something that has helped employers with retention because it's one of their biggest challenges is that the trailing spouse wants to move back home. So the employer spends thousands of dollars in training and then they lose the employee because the spouse isn't happy. Um, so we're, uh, we're working with organizations to help with their trailing spouse issues and we're helping them by catering to the trailing spouse. And so all of this has just opened the door for us, like with HR departments, with corporate relocation, um, and it's just been uh, it's been awesome in, in what we're building. So um, so do things like that. I mean, be be a media company that happens to sell real estate uh, and and get out there. But more importantly, I don't want that to be a distraction. When I coach somebody, I tell them that the attraction will come. What I need you to do right now is I need you to chase like crazy. I need you to do an open house every weekend. I need you to do whatever your chase is going to be. I need you to do it because the chase is what's going to put food on the table right now. And the attraction is going to help you build a business so that you don't burn out. Because if you chase your entire career, you'll burn out. Um, so the it's not scalable. I mean, once right. you stop doing it, the business stops coming in. Amen. Yep. Yep. That's, that's so huge. Yep. Yep. Love so you got to find that balance, and uh, yeah, yeah. I I've, I've loved watching. I love Madison, and what was cool is last October, October twenty seventeen, we were in Park City for uh, for the REM event, and yeah. you were just formulating your plans for I Love Madison, and I don't even think you had quite launched yet. Have or no, had we you? had not launched yet. We were just about to. Just about to. Yep. Okay, and, and to see what you've done with it from from then until now is awesome, and it, so I'm thinking of starting. A show called Yes, I Do Love Madison. 
and and it's just going to be me like fangirling <laughs> you and I love Madison, right? That's it, yeah. Or maybe we love Madison. Would, would that be yeah. would that be wrong? Yeah. Would that be a problem? <laughs> yeah. I love Madison too. That's another one. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> well, only you get to love Madison, Neil. Right. I love it too. <laughs> yeah, that's a monopoly, Neil. We have monopoly yeah. laws. You know? Right, right. <laughs> that's right. You can't just own the city. Yeah, Neil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we were talking yeah. a little bit before we started recording about I Love Madison, and, and I, th- I think this is really valuable for everybody to get because they've heard me talk a lot about content marketing, probably so much that they're like, shut up already about content marketing. Yes, yeah. But it's so key, and you said something that I thought was, was brilliant and so important. So when people are trying to decide – what to do? Like, do they do a vlog? Do they start blogging? Do it? Do they do a show? Do they um, do a podcast? Whatever. And they're trying to figure out what's going to work the best, but then they never do it because they want it to be perfect. You told me that your plan for what I Love Madison was going to look like, format-wise, like on which platforms, is very different from it. Is, it's very different from what it turned out to be now. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so when when I started, I wanted to do a podcast because I feel that I could interview anybody and everybody. Everybody will be okay with a microphone in front of them, but they're not okay with a camera in front of them. And also, I lacked camera skills, and I like I said, I have a face for radio, and I'm I'm used to doing podcasts, so it just became kind of like second nature. Well, then uh, I brought on Caleb Jar, who's a wickedly awesome videographer. He's super talented. He's fun. He's got a great personality. And so he, I brought him on board to help me with the videos because I knew that I needed to do video, but I was only going to do like video introductions of the podcast. So I brought him on board to do that. And then him and I were like, we should do an I Love Madison vlog and just document the building of I Love Madison. And that just never felt right. We recorded one week, we put one together and I'm like, this is just lame. It's not even... It's not, I, I felt like I was trying to be Gary Vee, and I'm like, this is, this, I don't like this. And so we didn't do anything with it. A, another couple of months went by, and we're like, ah, I know. The vlog should be about documenting Madison. Let's try to go to all these events. Let's do, like, Caleb versus Madison and have him try to do different things. Like, recently he just faced a, a, a pitcher from a minor league baseball team here in Madison, 85-mile-an-hour pitch to see if he could hit a ball. Um, so we started That's doing awesome. things like, yeah, yeah. So we started doing things like that. And um, and we have the I Love Madison Food Tournament, which is a, a tournament to decide who has Madison's best burgers, cheese curds, fish fry, uh, pizza, you know, all that stuff. And so uh, all of this was just doing really, really well on video. We're getting 3,000, minimum 3,000 views to some videos have 14, 15,000 views on them. And so we're like, this is blowing up. Uh, why are we doing this podcast? And so we we brought the podcast, we changed the format of the podcast to talk about the behind the scenes of the vlog. Because we're interviewing a lot of interesting people in Madison and there's a lot of side stories that are not being told on the vlog and a lot of funny shit's happening. And so the the podcast is just the beyond the lens of the po- of the show uh, or of the vlog. And uh, and so it's just Caleb and I recording, talking about the funny things that happened and happened, and we're promoting different things and and whatnot. And um, and our vlog was or our our podcast was only getting uh, about. 100 to 200 downloads where our videos were getting three to 13 and three to 14,000 views. So we decided to kind of make the podcast like the side dish versus the, the whole meat of the program. And so, uh, so we, we pivoted and it's been a good move and, and we're glad we did it. We did that. So you, you got started and you had an idea and a plan of what you were going to do, but then you got started, which is the key and, and the hardest mm-hmm. part. You look at the data and then you're like, hey, you know what? Like this is different than what I thought. And you had the sense to make an adjustment, to pivot and say, you know what? It, the vlog is is the gold. The podcast is – it's not as cool as we thought. That's amazing. And the key is to just freaking start because until you start getting feedback from the market, from the audience, it's all theory. Yep. That's it. Yep. Yep. Love yeah, it. and you just try. I mean, I remember when I was on Salt Lake City. You're like, dude, I love the Onion Juice podcast, but your intro is way too freaking long, and your ads are way too freaking long. Like, it's like ten minutes before I get any content out of you. 
And and I was like, shit, I never realized that. Like, I just that's just the way I started, and I just thought that the show sounded good, and it and it was growing, and I did it, you know. And you gave me that feedback, and I went back and changed it, you know. And it was like you uh, you've gotta you've gotta make pivots, and and don't be afraid to make pivots. There is it, it not one person noticed. Not I didn't get a phone call from anybody saying why is the I Love Madison show only every every other week now, and like why did the format change? Like nobody cares. <laughs> so just make the pivot, and you're fine. Exactly. Yeah. What's funny. Yeah. We talked about your intro. And then when I started the show and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, like I just started it and people who have been listening for a while, they know my story that I was walking the dog and listening to a Pat Flynn podcast. And I just decided, I'm like, I'm going to go home and record my first episode and I'm going to call it the massive agent podcast. Like it just, it came to me. I went home and did it. I didn't have a freaking clue how to do it, but I started Googling shit and watching YouTube videos and then you just do it. And then you, you know, you get feedback and you make adjustments. So, you know, what's funny is I told you your intro was too long. I started doing that. I started <laughs> doing the long intro where I do all my announcements and everything I wanted people to know about and, and talking about the massive agent society. I started doing that at, at the front. And then I was like, you know what? Like, why don't I just do that at the end? Like get, get to it. So I try to get to it as quickly as possible, uh, because you can still get everything in. It's just, you know, you learn better ways to do it. But if you were, if you hadn't started your podcast yet, you would never have figured that out. Right. Yep. So I love yep. it. Love it. Love it. All right. So I, I want to, uh, I'm going to start something new here because I'm planning over the next uh, four to six weeks, having a guest every week. Um, I think you're only our third guest. It's usually just been me pontificating and yeah. And so I want to bring other people in. And to be honest, collaborating like this, this is good because I can leverage your community and you can leverage mine. Right. That's why so many of the big podcasts out there and shows in general and Instagram influencers, they all uh, give shout outs to other people. And they're all uh, guests on each other's shows. It's so that everybody can leverage each other's networks. Yeah. So that's something you need to be doing too. If you have a local show, a local podcast, a vlog, whatever – get guests on because they are going to share it with their networks and that's a way for you to leverage their network. So I'm going to be doing that because I want to leverage the, le uh, the networks of my guests. It's, I mean, it's purely selfish, but at the same time it's collaborative. That's right. Yeah. That's how, that's you've been doing that forever with your show and it, it, yeah, you know, it works. You grow yep. faster. Yep. So something I want to do real quick, you've got to pick one or the other. I mean, I'm going to throw out some, some phrases here. Or not phrases, but choices, and you have to pick one or the other, and <laughs> we'll see where this goes. I I thought of this like as we were recording. Let's roll I'm with it. I'm nervous. You should be. <laughs> you should. You know, if I had a little bit more time to prepare, I could have come up with like some gotcha questions or you know something <laughs> that would embarrass you. But first off, I love you and would never do that. <laughs> never. Aside from coming on your show, that's as embarrassing to you as I get. But <laughs> nonetheless. Buyers or sellers? Sellers. Facebook. All day long. Oh, all day long. Yeah, because you can get buyers from sellers. That's right. And with with listings, you can actually use your marketing skills. You can't right. so much with buyers. There's no marketing. Right. right. Yeah. yeah, I love listings. Facebook yeah. or Instagram? Facebook. Instagram or Snapchat? Instagram. Are we in a bubble or not in a bubble? We're in a bubble. Burgers or cheese curds? <laughs> Both, man. You gotta have them together. They're like, they're like uh, burgers and fries here in Wisconsin. It's burgers and cheese curds. Well, see, now you're just breaking the rules. And if you want to be a guest again on the show, Neil, you're gonna have to follow the rules. <laughs> All right, I'd rather have a, I'd rather have a burger. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> right on, right on. Podcast or vlog? Vlog. Denver Broncos or Green Bay Packers? Packers, go pack! Okay, well, it really went off the rails there at the end with that wrong answer, but um, all right. No, I, I'm going to try to do that with every guest, and I'll, I'll think of some uh, some better ones. But um, I like it, man. Yeah, it just gives a little quick insight into priorities and, and what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so are you messing around with, with any voice marketing stuff like Alexa skills or flash briefings? 
So I'm, I, yeah, I'm just starting to get into the voice. Uh, we are going to be doing it with the podcast. And so it's going to be in a, in a chat bot. And then we're going to do a daily pro, uh, uh, broadcast, uh, voice broadcast broadcast. I am, I'm like clueless on the whole thing, which is just like, I'm, I've got to like learn more about it. Um, they're, they're excited about it and they know what they're doing. And so I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> and so they just basically told me I need to keep producing pro- content like I'm producing and they'll take it from there. So nice. Um, yeah, nice. Yeah. So that's coming out soon for the onion juice. And that's just going to be, they're just going to do it all through messenger. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've got the flash briefing that I call the massive agent minute. And I just do like 60 to 90 seconds a day, seven days a week. And it's on Alexa. Um, it, it, I don't know. It's a way for me to just kind of like rant about something or give a quick thought or an idea that comes to my head. It's a way to quickly do it without waiting to record the next podcast episode. And okay. it's just an, another way of, of touching people and getting, you know, giving them access, giving them information that they want. Some people want uh, smaller doses of me, but more often, you know, I totally understand people that want smaller doses of me. I get it. <laughs> right, so, right. so there's their avenue is, is the flash briefing. But I'm yeah. this is interesting what you're doing. I'm I'm going to keep my eye on that because that's a, that's a new way of of uh, using voice and uh, and chatbots yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I don't really get it all. I'm just yeah. Like sounds good. Let's do it. <laughs> right on. Yep. Start <laughs> it and figure it out. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I had another question, and and this podcast is going a lot longer than normal. Normally we're like twenty. 20 to 25 minutes, but this is going to be closer to an hour, but I think it's, it's worth it. I get asked a lot for people who want to start content marketing. They want to start a vlog or a show or a podcast and they get so hung up on equipment and finding somebody to help them like a videographer or an editor or whatever. You've been, you've done a great job of getting other people to come work on I love Madison with you. What pointers do you have for people to find a videographer to, to help them do their vlog? What, what advice do you have um, to get that starting and to find the right people? Start by getting sponsors. Okay. You've got to get people on board to help afford to be able to pay the videographer. Don't go to the videographer and say, Hey, will you do all this work for me for free for exposure? Um, it is, it is rude to do that to an artist and and an artist needs to get paid okay that's what they're in business for and they're not going to get ex- they don't need exposure they could create their own videos and do their own thing and get their own exposure if they wanted to they they need to get paid so don't go out to a, a videographer and look for a deal because that deal will not last okay it'll be short lived Make them a part of the show. Make them a part of the process. Make, you know, give them um, really, you know, if you can find a videographer that wants to be in front of the camera, that's awesome because it just adds to the context of the story. Um, but but find a way to pay them. Um, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, if you if you did two episodes and you paid them 500 an episode, that would be $1,000 a, a month. Um, that, that would be, that would work. And then just go find sponsors to sponsor that $1,000 a month or say, I'm going to make this an investment in my business, and instead of spending uh, $1,000 a month on Zillow or whatever, I'm going to put it into this show, and I'm going to really work hard to have a good call to action on the show that's going to bring, bring me buyers and sellers. And, and the, the thing with a, with a vlog is you get attention, and that's the most important thing is you've got to get intention, uh, attention. But then the second most important thing is you've got to get people to trust you um, because you can, you can walk into the street on fire and get attention, right? But nobody's going to trust you. They're going to think you're an idiot for doing that. So you've got to get so attention. So I shouldn't have done that? Yeah, don't do that, Dustin. Okay. <laughs> so you've got to get attention and trust. And if you can do that in a vlog, that that's what I love about vlogs is because people, you build up trust. People start to get to know you and trust you before they even meet you. And so that's what I love about uh, the vlog is they really get to know me. Um, but then um, the vlog also is really good at getting attention, especially when we put out a post like we just did one where, you know, Caleb just went against this this pitcher at a minor league baseball team. And, you know, it's like the question is, is does, did Caleb get a hit? And it's getting all these, you know, like everybody's kind of rooting for Caleb and they're watching the video for at least five minutes before they find out that he that he got a hit. 
And and so like um, actually it was just a fall tip. Um, but but he got a hold of one of the balls. <laughs> he touched the ball with he the bat. Touched the ball. That's with fantastic. The bat. Yeah, that, that that counted. Um, and uh, and then there was all these extra stories like the coach was heckling him and said, hey, if you get a foul ball, I'll buy you a steak dinner. And you know, so when he did get a foul ball, everybody went crazy. And you know, like it it just uh, it's entertaining. Uh, and it gets attention, but it, it also creates this engagement. And the, the you know the, we loaded the video yesterday afternoon, and by this morning it already has eighteen hundred views on it. Um, and it's and it, it's things like that that. Um, but but you got to you. So like I'm saying, you got to get that attention, you got to get that trust, but then you got to get that call to action. Uh, and our call to action is to help people that are new to Madison get connected and to help the trailing spouse. And so we've got a really good call to action that's bringing people to us that we can help them with the real estate needs. And so um, I know that was a long answer, but man, like Ooh, just, me. just 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 no, start, just start with getting a sponsor, cast the vision, um, and and go to people that you know. I mean, we have a we have a grocery store, uh, Metcalf's Market in Madison here. That's one of our sponsors. They've just been awesome. And uh, been a been a big supporter, and they're giving us content to go document too. That that's fantastic advice. So, like, if you're going to start a show, you need to be able to have consistency in doing that show for a long period of time, and that starts with setting things up correctly. Like Neil said, go get a sponsor first. When I started my Salt Lake Insider show, I did not. I was paying for my videographer out of pocket, and when I met with him, I mean, and he was kind of doing like he said, "Hey, I'll give you a deal." for exposure like mm-hmm. and we talked about that and it was a i think i was paying 150 per episode which is awesome and he handled uh the recording the editing everything we just i just had to show up but like you said that deal doesn't last because he's good yep. at what he does and he yep. he realized hey like there's an opportunity cost here if i'm only doing these episodes for you that take this much time and it's only 150 i could be making you know 1500 or 2000 spending that time on this other project Yep. And so yep. that, you know, just like you said, he, he raised his prices. It no longer made sense for me to come out of pocket for. And so the show stopped because I did, it's not something I planned for. And I hate that it drives me nuts because I always talk about consistency, but because I didn't set it up correctly from the beginning, that's what happened. So I think your advice was spot on and it will really help some people prevent what happened to me. So if you, if you have a sponsor, it's covering the cost. You can pay somebody what they're worth so that they're excited to work with you long-term. That's the recipe for a great long-term show. Yeah. The other thing that I failed at with the sponsorship is I went to professionals. So I went to an insurance agent and to a lender and they were both on board, but neither one of them got any business out of it because it just doesn't, it doesn't help them. Their, their brand uh, doesn't need that kind of exposure and there's really no direct referral going to them. And so it didn't work for them. Now with the grocery store, they need eyeballs on their brand and they're at a different level. So I wouldn't, I would, I mean, you can get, you can get the professionals on board in the beginning, but it might not last because it they may not see the value in it. And, but like with this grocery store, they're asking questions of like how many, how many views per thousand they're used to paying 75 to a hundred dollars per thousand views. I'm giving them about 25 to $35, uh, uh, a per thousand of views. And so they love me and, and they also love our personality in there and we're an influencer for their brand. And so you look for the right brands. Don't, you know, maybe you get the low hanging fruit to get started. But be looking for a brand, you know, a, a, a grocery store, a car dealership, um, you know, who's ever advertising on the radio, who's spending big dollars on the radio. They're the ones that would see value in your blog. That's great advice. Yeah. People who advertise on the radio in newspapers, billboards, bus benches. Yep. Strangely, yep. a lot of realtors do, which is asinine, but that's another show. Awesome. Neil. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff today. We we covered a lot of different topics. Uh, you know, when you and I get together on a podcast, we just kind of roll with it. And I think there was a lot of great stuff that came out of this, even though the squirrel did make an appearance, of course. But that's good. We like the squirrel. The squirrel's healthy. <laughs> squirrel's healthy. At least that's we what I tell myself. Squirrel. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Cool, man. Awesome, man. Well, hey, get back to work. It sounds like you've uh, you probably got some listing appointments or uh, showings to go do. I, I know I've got some showings to go do. So, uh Thanks for being on the Massive Agent Podcast, my friend. Thanks for having me, brother. It was great. Absolutely. Talk to you soon.
Guys, I know we covered a lot in this interview. I think it, I mean, there's a lot of value here. There's a lot of things to unpack. I hope you picked something up from that that can help you in your business. Regardless of where you're at in your business, I'm sure there's something in here that we talked about and that we covered that can help you. So really quick to remind you guys, we do have our our Alexa flash briefing. It's called the Massive Agent Minute. All you have to do is go into the Alexa app and click on skills and games from the menu in the upper left. Type in Massive Agent in the skills and games section and you'll find the Massive Agent Minute. Enable it and that's all you have to do. Then just, just say, Alexa, play my briefings, play my daily briefings, and it'll play. So we do one every single day and it's my way of bringing a tip or a rant or an idea or a bit of motivation or just something that's on my mind in 60 to 90 seconds, bring it to you guys on a daily basis, seven days a week. So it's a way for me to stay in touch with you guys and keep delivering content to you guys every day, even though the podcast only comes out once a week. And now I feel like I'd be derelict in my freaking duties. If I didn't mention the Massive Agent Society, go over to massiveagentsociety.com. That is our lead generation training and support system for Facebook ads and basically showing you how to take full control over your lead gen so you don't need Boomtown and you don't, you don't need Ylopo and you don't need all these crazy expensive platforms and to uh, to run ads for you. We're going to show you how to do it yourself and then give you the support to make the tweaks and adjustments necessary to make sure that the leads are actually coming in. That's the key. So we do that. It's called the Massive Agent Society. It's been launched for a few weeks few weeks. What the hell? It's been launched for a few months since uh, April 1st. And keep in mind, if you're just hearing about it, we do only allow one agent per market. So if you want to make sure that your market is even available to reserve for yourself, go over to the website, massiveagentsociety.com and check out the sold out markets to make sure yours is still available. And lastly, you guys have heard me talk a few times about eXp Realty. I am fairly new to eXp. I've been there since, uh, since May. I love it. I'm absolutely in love with it. And I'm what I'm doing is I'm building a team. I'm building a team around the world, okay, in, right now in uh, in the U.S. and in Canada of like-minded agents that we can work together side by side as teammates. Everybody who joins EXP Realty with me, you're getting a free lifetime membership to the Massive Agent Society because I want to make sure you have the tools that you need to be successful. I, I mean, if you're coming to, to work with me and to join me at EXP, I want you to make more money. I want you to sell a crap load more homes. And, I, and we have the Massive Agent Society, which helps people do that. So you're going to get it for free by joining me at eXp. If you have any questions on how that works or what eXp is all about or any of that, and you don't really want to talk, you just want to like watch things at your own speed, and I get it. That's how I am. Just go to MassiveAgentPodcast.com slash eXp. MassiveAgentPodcast.com slash eXp. There's a video. Hit play on it. That explains it. If you have any questions, hit me up after. Simple as that. And lastly, this is very important. I have, I have some orders for you. Go out this weekend and get a new client. Okay. Go out and get a new client. Go get one. Okay. That's your goal. Get a new client this weekend. Talk to as many people as you need to reconnect with old leads, send out a, a mass text to some old leads and say, Hey, I'm available to show homes this weekend. I had, I have an opening. So if you still are looking for a home, let's talk something like that. Like just reach out to people, reach out to a few hundred of them through a mass text through your CRM you'll be surprised how many actually reconnect with you. Get a new client this weekend. That's your goal. Thanks, guys. I'm Dustin Brome, your host, signing off. Take care.